Ladies and gentlemen, in this video, we are going to do two things. First, I'm going to give you an update about the really strange and rather upsetting story about Ding Li Ren, the current world chess champion here in January of 2024. But then, the second thing that we are going to do is I'm going to show you the most beautiful chess game that Ding Li Ren has ever played. And that game happened in 2017. It is a breathtaking game of chess. Frankly, it should be considered art. And the purpose of doing that is to hope that we get that Ding Li Ren back at some point in the future, that creative and inspired chess genius that he is and the type of incredible chess that he is capable of playing. So here's where we stand in January of 2024. Ding Li Ren is the classical world champion. Magnus Carlsen is the rapid and blitz world champion and also the number one rated player in the world across all the formats. Magnus declined to participate in the world championship cycle that ultimately culminated in April of 2023. Ding Li Ren played against Yanni Pomnishi. He won the match. Then he played a tournament in Romania like a week later that he had already agreed to play. Didn't do that great. And then he vanished. The world champion of chess vanished. That is not an understatement. He has not played a rated chess game of standard, also known as classical, long games, rapid or blitz, in eight months. If not longer. And he not only has not played a classical rapid or blitz game over the board, he hasn't played online. Since December of 2022, Ding Li Ren has played three rapid games on chess.com, and that last one he disconnected due to internet issues, lost basically on time, and never played again. He played three games in all of 2023 on chess.com in rapid format. That's crazy. That is, uh... That's wild. I'm not sure when's the last time a world chess champion reigning hasn't played a tournament in eight months. Now, listen, I only hope Ding is okay. I hope he's okay mentally. I hope he's okay physically. And there is going to be another world championship. The candidates tournament, which determines who's going to play against Ding Liren for the world championship, is happening in a couple of months. It's going to happen in Toronto, Canada. It's going to feature players like Yan Yipomishi, Pragnananda of India, Gukesh, Hikaru Nakamura, Fabiano Karawana. I mean, I might as well just name the entire field. And they're going to play against Ding Li Ren, unless he doesn't defend his title. Now, Ding Li Ren is playing in the Tata Steel Masters. That's a tournament that happens quite soon. It's happening actually in a week. We're going to see Ding Li Ren back in action. That's a tournament that happens in the Netherlands in early January. Uh, and it's uh, mid-January, really. And it's called the Wimbledon of Chess. So we'll see what happens. But Ding Li Ren did reappear at a tournament in China. Something of a warm-up. This was called the... First ever Chinese chess kings type of thing. It was uh, naturally it was a field of some of the best players in China, like Yu Yangi, Wang Hao, Wei Yi, uh, Jin Xibai, uh, and uh, there were some other uh, young guys that had to qualify to play. But the craziest thing about this event, it was a rapid tournament just finished. Um, Ding got fourth place. He tied for fourth place. He actually lost in the semifinal to Wang Hao, and then he lost the third and fourth place match to Wei Yi. And the reason for that is, well, he's probably a little bit out of shape. Like, he hasn't played an elite tournament in eight months. If any athlete sat out for eight months, the same thing would happen. Doesn't matter if it's tennis, doesn't matter if it's football, doesn't matter if it's baseball, which is not a real sport. But, you know, you get, you get my point. Like, he's got to be active. And I have no idea what the future holds for him. But I do know what he was his whole career. And that's the purpose of today's video. Obviously, I will be covering Tata Steel, uh, which is coming up, but um, today I'd like to go back in time. I'd like to go back in time uh, about six and a half years ago. This was a game played in the Chinese Chess League. Every country, not every country, but many, many countries in the world have a league. They play like a competitive team format. And um, in, uh, in this event, by the way, I think the, 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 the names here are wrong. Like... I think Chinese and Indian names are, are frequently written with the last name first. I think it should be Bai Jin Shi. So I'm gonna I'm gonna change that. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna do it like this. I think that's correct. I mean I'm assuming that's correct. I think his name is technically pronounced 
uh, Jin Shibai, I think. I think that's how you would you would pronounce it. Uh, but and I try to pronounce all the names uh, correctly. So <clears throat> if that is incorrect, then I apologize. But I'm doing my best now. Uh, Jin Shibai has been a grandmaster for uh, many years. He's very strong, even though he's very young. He's born in 1999, so he's 23, 24, which is uh, which is pretty wild. Uh, I guess he's 24, 20, yeah, one and 23 years. 24, maybe, maybe turn 25 in January. And this was one of the most incredible games I've ever seen. So sit back, relax, uh, put me up on the smart TV. Let me take a sip of coffee because I'm gonna need. I'm gonna finish my coffee and then you know we'll take a little little break here. I really hope Ding Liren comes back. I mean, I, I hope, I hope we get something out of him. I, I, I don't know what's going on. Um, I don't know if it's the stress of the situation, burnout, a hatred of chess, but handcuffed to play it. I don't know. So, uh, Jin Shi started with d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3. This is a very standard opening. Uh, knight c3 is trying to play e4. This setup by black enables black to play a very quick bishop to b4, pinning the knight to the king. Uh, knight c3 is taking on that challenge. It's a very critical move because black plays the critical defense of the nimso. Uh, and now we have many, 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 many lines. The main lines being queen to c2, the Rubenstein with e3, uh, and uh, you could play f3, which is called the same-ish. Uh, a3, or maybe a... Technically, I think a3 is called the same-ish, but f3, e4 type of stuff. White plays knight f3, though, which is a sideline. It's not the most popular move. The reason for that is you could have played knight f3 without playing knight c3, and if black had gone here, you would have never played knight c3. So that's kind of like you would go knight bd2 or bishop d2 or queen d2. Um, but uh, the point is that this is, you know, this is still a move. Of course, it's just equal. Ding castled. He's not doing anything with the bishop yet because he wants white to waste a move attacking it. White does not waste a move attacking it. He pins the knight to the queen, developing. Next, he will play e3, finish up like this. Now Ding plays c5. In the Nimso with black, you choose which of these two pawns are going to be used to attack the center, or you just go with both. Um, <clears throat> c5 is fine. Sometimes you take take and then you play d6. You actually don't attack the center right away. You play very solidly, put a lot of pawns on dark squares, and you fight against white's uh, doubled pawns here. And white says, you're stupid, those doubled pawns are not a weakness, and for giving up your dark squared bishop, you're going to give me the center, and then a lot of space. It's kind of like a silent uh, conversation, uh, which is basically all that chess is. Now, e3 was played by, uh, by Jin Shi, and then he wants to play bishop here, and he wants the castle. c takes d4. And now white plays a sideline. A sideline is a move that is by far le less popular than the other moves, uh, e takes d4 and knight takes d4. Uh, well, knight takes d4 is actually not a not a great move because queen goes here and there's kind of a, a complete inability to defend your position. So you would need to play bishop takes, bishop takes, 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 king e2, uh, and then uh, be down a pawn with a, with a really stupid king. But then you could play king f3 and then meme around and lose. Uh, but Baijin Shi here plays queen takes d4. The idea of queen takes d4 is to put pressure and open the d-file. Basically, he just doesn't want to close the d-file. He wants to keep the queen here. He is willing to take the attack on his queen to slide back or that way, not to g4, but maybe to h4, f4, and then bring the rook. So we have knight c6, queen d3, and now we see this position. Right? White might castle. White might just play rook d1 and try to castle this way. Uh, now, Ding could immediately go for the center, but first he asks Jin Shibai, like, what are you doing here? What are you doing with the bishop? You know, you're obviously not going to take, so you're going to go da down this way, or you're going to go this way. And uh, Ding does not mess around here. So rather than stalling at all with any more moves, Ding attacks the center. And the reason he's able to do this move is because white doesn't actually have the ability to take with the knight. Meaning, let's just say the position was uh, something like this. This would be a much worse situation. Because the knight actually does pressure the center, and then you are threatening to take, take, and take again. But with the bishop on b4, that's not the case. And if you play a3 with white, I will happily do this, take, quickly finish up my development, I'll be in good shape. But, after rook to d1, Ding Li Ren, like I said, wastes absolutely no time. He plays the move d5, and in this position, he says, I'm kind of tired of being pinned... I'm not going to take, I'm not going to play your game. G5, 
So, Ding breaks a rule. All right, not like a rule like, you know, he didn't move his pawn three squares. He breaks a heuristic in chess. In chess, we say, you don't want to push pawns in front of your king because you're going to weaken your king, which is a good rule for 99% of chess players. But in chess, rules are meant to be broken. In chess, you are taught something which is useful for a massive part of the rating ladder, and then you get to a point where you can make exceptions. You have to get good enough where you can break certain rules. The reason why black is able to play a move like this is because it pushes the bishop backwards and immediately black is able to seize what's called the initiative. The knight comes to the center, applying pressure to the bishop and the knight, which is pinned to the king. White is two moves away from consolidating, but he's never gonna get those two moves. Because if you play bishop e2, I play queen a5, and all of a sudden you cannot defend your knight. If you play rook c1, I'm gonna grab this pawn, which you can't take because of the pin. So. That is why you are able to play a move like g5. Also, you're not worried about the open king. You're not worried about the open king. That's not, you, it's not good. Don't, you know, don't, there's, there's nothing there. Just nobody can come help you. So bishop g3, knight e4, and jinship I plays knight d2. Blocking the pin and trying to trade the knight. Now, Ding does what every good fighter does. He fakes the shot. He, he fakes an attack with his knight to get a reaction out of his opponent to go backwards, and he puts the knight on c5, attacking the queen. So the queen moves out of the way, and now he's really attacking white with this move d4. This is a really big problem. You cannot take, because that invites massive problems. The queen goes back, now I'll play e5 and get the bishop out. It's a really, really, really bad position. I will avalanche my pawns. White is still two moves away from consolidating. He's never gonna get those two moves. So instead of that, Baijin Shu plays knight f3. All right, and the idea is that the pawn can't move because of the pin, which is why Ding plays e5. Okay, nice. Defending this. But if you look at the position, that pawn is capturable, right? In fact, white might actually have to take it because if you play something like bishop here, I'll get the queen out of the way. There is no pin, and you are still pinned. So you're going to lose your knight. So Bajin Shri takes a deep breath. Says, all right, you know what? Let's have some fun. Knight takes e5. Knight takes e5. And now there are many, many, many head-spinning complications. Black cannot just take back because then he will lose this pawn. So he can't do that. What he can do is get the queen out this way and put pressure. He can also get the queen out this way and put pressure. He can also play rook e8 and continue to attack white's king, which is still in the center. But instead of all of that, the inspired Ding Li Ren played the unbelievable move Pawn takes knight. This man sacrificed his entire queen. He decided now was his moment. Pawn takes knight. White has nothing better. White has to take the queen. And the idea for Ding was before he would capture back, he would play an in-between move. Pawn takes b2 check. Okay? Pawn takes b2 check. With an attack on the king. This pawn is very menacing. It's a square away from queening at all times. White really would like to get rid of it, but his rook is also hanging. Now, you look at me here, I think king is under attack, rook is under attack. Of course, you save both. You gotta you got save both. You gotta get out. It's not so easy, because then black immediately follows up with a haymaker. Put pressure on the pin piece. White comes back to play defense. Black brings another piece into the game. And at this point, you would have to go for queen b2, maybe even knight e4. Look at this. I mean, how do you deal with all of this pressure? The computer is not intimidated. The computer always manages to find a way. You know, the computer goes to an endgame and thinks, I'll probably survive. But Bai Jinshi is not a, not a computer, he's a human being. And he decides, I'm going to bring my king up, I'm going to give my rook up, and then I'm going to take the pawn. Now there's no more headaches. Now there's no more headaches, okay? I'm safe. Which is what he thought. <laughs> Dingly Ren. Dingly Ren, though. He, he knew. He had something up his sleeve. So, again, black could get the queen right back, but this is like investing in something and pulling it out the same day. And I'm not talking about crypto pump and dump. Like, I'm talking about, you know, uh, actually, before you take back, better move is to go here first and then take. That's not what we're trying to do. Queen takes b2. Ding plays knight a4. Continuing his initiative. An initiative in chess is a series of moves where you attack your opponent, but you improve your position. 
So you attack the queen, the bishop is defended by the knight, but then the knight is going to come in here and force the king out. That's exactly what happens. Queen c2, knight c3, king f3. All right, queen c2, knight c3, king f3. Now, <clears throat> it looks like there's a checkmate here. There's no checkmate. All right, there's no checkmate. Uh, g4 check doesn't work. Knight takes g4. Look how quickly white can get a winning position, by the way. Black has to be very careful. Black's pieces are nice, but you trade a couple of them off. Black has no attack. Also, Dingley Ren is down two points of material, right? So, g4, knight takes. Now, what if you play knight takes, bishop takes, and then g4? Well, king is safe. King is out. King is in danger, in theory. But there's no checks. So, you know, like, is it really, is it good? No. No, there's nothing. No. So, what do you play here? Well, Dingley Ren had planned ahead. And in this position, he played one of the most badass moves I've ever seen in my life. King is trying to escape, get to his vacation home. You want to take the knight. We got bishop e5. Like, black has to act now. He's got to act now because white is going to play h4. White is actually going to turn the attack black, uh, back on black. That's what you're going to do. So in this position, my, you could pause here and try to find it if you, if you really want to. You want to play like the, uh, the immortal game of Dingley Ren. In this position, not only did we stop the king's escape, we re-threatened checkmate with black with the absolutely gangster move, rook to d4. Oh my god. It seals the fourth rank shut, threatens pawn to g4, which is mate. That's mate. If you take, that's mate. Ah, damn, you might as well mate with the pawn. And the other idea of rook d4 is the rook is untouchable because when you take the rook, there's this. Oops. Rook d4 is crazy. When you get hit with a move like rook d4, that's when you start soul searching. You start wondering why you showed up to the tournament. You start wondering how you're losing to a five-year-old that's licking his fingers and eating cheeses at the board. Not these guys, because they're really, really good, but you, who plays a chess tournament, and plays a child and is like, I can't believe I'm losing to this tiny human being. These guys are grown-ups, but you still get hit with a move like Rook D4. You're like, oh, yeah, oh, that's probably the end. So, Baijin Chi plays H3. Makes sense. He wants to stop G4. Dingley Ren continues to push pawns in front of his own king because there's only one king right now that's feeling very uncomfortable. Now, White tries to survive. Bishop h2. He's ready for g4, and he's going to play king to g3. Now, the incredible thing about this position, it's still hanging on a knife's edge. Ding Li Ren has to continue to find the best moves. It's minus 2.3, but only we know that. They don't know that. So, Ding plays g4 check. White plays king g3. <clears throat> and now there is one and only one move to maintain the advantage. Black wants to play knight e4 check. But he wants to do it in a way that white cannot go there. If knight e4, now I play here, and then the knight is hanging, and the rook is hanging. So you inverse the order. First you play the only move, rook d2. And you realize that is the second sacrifice of the rook. Oh my god. Oh my god. You still can't take it. It's hanging. It's completely unguarded. But you can't take it because of this. Not only is it a fork, it's also a discovered attack. Disrespect to the max. Rook to d2, the queen goes out, which allows the knight to jump to e4. The best move there was to take the rook, by the way. By Jinshi, like any normal humans, like, no, I want to keep my queen. Knight e4, the king runs out to h4. And my man Ding just absolutely slaughters the king on h4. Zips back with his bishop, forces king takes h5. Look at the king. This man went on a spiritual journey. This man went up, up. Up, up, up. He's just going straight up the board. That's what he's doing. King G. Oh my god. The best move in this position is not with the rook or the knight or the knight or the bishop or the bishop. It's king to g7. Stopping any further king advancement and setting up the threat of a bishop move and rook h8. The silent and embarrassing defeat of the white king. So, Baijinshi knows this and he's like, all right, I gotta act fast. Bishop to f4. Coming to help the king. We're going to play bishop h6. And maybe we'll play c5 and get the queen in there. c5, queen f7 is lethal. Absolutely lethal. Let's not forget, white still has a queen. Black does not. Ding the run plays bishop f5. Giving up b7, which would normally be a collapse of the black position. 
But rook to h8 is game over. White plays bishop h6 check. He's covering up. Not only is he covering up, he's forcing the black king to block his own h file. Well, that's got to be good defense. And now he plays queen takes b7. The rook is hanging. The knight is hanging. The bishop is hanging. If the knight moves, if you play knight takes knight, for example, I'll take and look at the advantage. It's gone. It's gone. Has somehow this, this, this absolute clown standing on h5 will survive the attack. You come back to try to defend yourself. I'll bring my bishop out. How is white not made it? I don't know. I don't know. Stranger things have happened. But it's actually not so clear unless you are Dingley Ren. To Dingley Ren, it is clear. Because in this position, he chucks the rook, he chucks the knight, he leaves the bishop exactly where it is, and he plays rook takes f2. Which is a move that doesn't even look like it makes sense. But it does. It has a threat. The threat is knight g3 mate. That rook stops the pawn from guarding g3. So rook f2, if you take the rook, this is checkmate. Oh my. Rook f2. So now Baijin Shi plays bishop g5. And if you take this, let's say you play bishop takes g5, uh oh, it's actually your king who's in danger. And if you take with a knight, you no longer have knight that knight here. I get this, I get that, I get that. And, and, and again, by a miracle, this king is surviving. It's a, it's a puzzle. It's like a Rubik's Cube, this position. Bishop to g5. Ding Li Ren finds the best move. Now he brings his rook. And now, with the king stranded and the threat of a mate with a king move, the white king is stuck. But... Knight takes f7. Knight takes f7. One last dagger attempt by white to get rid of the rook. But the knight stops defending the g6 square. And in this position, Ding Li Ren plays bishop g6 check, forces the king to go backwards. And now, black to move. What is the winning idea? If you take the knight, I play queen takes knight. If you give me check, we just repeat the position a couple of times. I'll continue to dance my way out of it. So how do you win? You can't play knight e5 because the knight will just take. Well, as it turns out, that is exactly what you do. You have to get rid of the knight. The knight has to stop guarding the bishop. The knight has to stop guarding the bishop, so you play knight e5 check. Deflecting the knight from the defense of the bishop on g5, in this position, Bai Jinshi resigned, because knight takes e5, bishop f5 check. Let's say the king goes here. King g7 is mate. And if you go to h4, king g7 is mate in one. And the reason you couldn't do this right away, the reason you couldn't play bishop f5 right away, is because after something like king h5, king g7, I would have taken your rook. So the rook has to be deflected off of, and the bishop. And the way Ding Li Ren wins this game is by sacrificing his knight to deflect the knight from both of those positions. This was one of the craziest games I've ever seen Ding Liren play. This man, from the opening, sacrificed the pawn, sacrificed a queen, proceeded to put his rook on an untouchable square. Rook d4. You get hit with rook d4. It's over. Ain't, you ain't bouncing back. And then he continues the attack with the only move. Rook d2. <coughs> deflecting the queen out. Knight e4 check, hunts the king to the corner, sets up this absurd checkmating net, and against all odds, gives away all the rest of his pieces to threaten knight g3 mate. What a game. What a game. Excuse me, that is not what happened. Knight f7, uh, that is what happened. Knight e5 check. What, I mean, he sacrificed every piece. He straight up gave away like half his army in this game. What a game. And I, and I just wanted to show you this because, man, I, I really hope we get... Well, maybe we won't get this Dingley Ren back, but we, we just get a Dingley Ren back. He's going to be playing in Tata Steel. Um, it's the biggest mystery of the chess world. He wins the world championship, doesn't elaborate, leaves. <laughs> but I hope he's all right. The chess world is anxiously awaiting his return. And uh, we wish him nothing but the best. Hope you enjoyed this game from 2017. What a game this was. I mean, just an unbelievable game of chess. Um, that's all. Get out of here.